episode of our Vision Talk series. For those who are maybe not a year away yet, we are part of um, the Worldwide Neuro. It's a COVID-inspired seminar hosting platform for neuroscience. Talks are organized there every day on a broad variety of topics. Most of them are already available as podcasts. So take a look at the website and subscribe to the newsletter if you don't want to miss any talk you or your colleague might be interested in. I will also take this opportunity to talk to you about a new platform that uh, Timbo Girls and Panos Bozelos, the founders of Worldwide Neuro, just created. It's dubbed Worldwide Neighbors. It's a platform which is actually an academic jobs board aimed to disseminate listening from both employers and job seekers. That means that in addition to a traditional board disseminating listing by employers, early careers fellows, like in terms PhD students or postdoc, can advertise their availability on the market too. Those both job seekers and employers can benefit by this hybrid model in traditional plus reverse say, way. So to make it more appealing and useful, they have also implemented a smart matching functionality. So if you opt in for it, your listing will be displayed with your nearest scientific neighbors. Technically your peers can be your postdocs or PIs who might work on topics very similar to your own interest. That way you can get more ideas on who to consider as your next employer or job applicant. So please check it out. Links are in the description below and just consider taking the time to submit your own listening. It only takes five minutes. Now for our today's talk, I'm very glad to receive Martin Kimmermans from the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. Martin obtained his PhD from the University of Amsterdam in 85, in, sorry, in 89, oh, sorry. Then moved to the US for a postdoctoral position at the University of California at Berkeley with Frank Werblin. And then he went back to the Netherlands. He received the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science Fellowship. He then established the Retinal Signal Processing Lab at the Netherlands Ophthalmic Research Institute that he later moved to the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. He is now a full professor in neurophysiology, specialized in sensory physiology at the University of Amsterdam. His research group focuses among other topics on how our digital cells inhibit photoreceptors and what consequences this has for vision. So, hello, Martin, and thank you for accepting our invitation today. Okay. So, um, I have to share my screen now, I think. Yeah. And I will see you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the work of my group uh, on this platform. So we will take a long journey uh, today and we will start discussing synaptic uh, transmission in the outer retina. So where photoreceptors and bipolar cells and horizontal cells interact. We will look at detailed um, interactions between horizontal cells and photoreceptors. In the second part of the talk, we will discuss how these, uh, the specifics of this, these uh, synaptic connections influence vision and in special uh, in influence uh, color vision. So, but uh, every, so let's uh, start um, at the beginning. So basically the first uh, ex uh, indications that there was something interesting going on in the outer retina came from the paper by Verblin and Dowling in 68, 1968, where they showed that when you project a spot of light on the retina, photoreceptors hyperpolarize, horizontal cells hyperpolarize, and uh, uh, bipolar cells hyperpolarize. However, when you present an analyst, photoreceptors don't respond, horizontal cells, cells still respond, and bipolar cells depolarize. This experiment showed that there was a central surround organization already present in the outer retina. So, and that's what we are going to discuss today, the mechanism of how that comes about. So everybody agrees that photoreceptors project to horizontal cells via a glutamatergic pathway. However, how horizontal cells feed back to the photoreceptors is a matter of debate. In the 80s of the past century, everybody was convinced that GABA was the neurotransmitter. In 2001, we proposed another mechanism, an effective mechanism. And in 2003, Aki Kaneko and colleagues proposed that the horizontal cells used uh, protons to feed back to horizontal cells. Since then, basically, there was a big fight which mechanism was the real feedback mechanism. What I would like to do today in this talk is to uh, 
to make to discuss a synthesis of those three mechanisms. What I will propose is that all three mechanisms are uh, present <coughs> in uh, and have specific functions. So the effective mechanism is one of the fastest inhibitory systems known and is most likely involved in spatial redundancy reduction. The pH buffer mechanism is relatively slow and is involved in temporal redundancy reduction. And the GABAergic mechanism is very slow and modulates feedback signal during light dark adaptation. So, but let's start to look, have a closer look at this feedback signal from horizontal cells to cones. When you record from a cone with a voltage clamp condition, you see a standing inward current. And when you flash on a spot of light, then you see that this inward current is uh, reduced and it remains reduced as long as the light is on. And then when the light is switched off, the response uh, reappears, of the standing inward current reappears. However, when we keep the spot on and uh, flash a full field stimulus in addition, we see this small inward current. This is a small current, look at the scale bar. This is 10 picoamps and this is 100 picoamps. So when you, so the first thing we did was look at the nature of this current, which, cur which channel generates this current. The result was that it is a modulation of the calcium current in the photoreceptor. So this is the calcium current of a photoreceptor when feedback is not active. When we activate feedback, the calcium current is shifted to negative potentials and there is a slight increase in amplitude. So the first result, this is completely different than what you would expect from a GABAergic mechanism. And indeed, this shift of the calcium current is independent of GABA. But we will come back to that later. So this was found in goldfish. However, since then, many, many people found this similar behavior in uh, different animals, in goldfish, in newt, in macaque, in mouse, and in salamander. So this modulation of the calcium current is a very conserved feature of negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones. Recently, we also found that this shift on the calcium current occurs in cultured human retinas. So when you look, have a very close look at the feedback response in measured in photoreceptors, you can see that this feedback consists of two processes. A very fast one and a very slow one. The fast one has a time constant of about 30 milliseconds and the slow one and time constant of, let's say, 200 milliseconds. So let's, so this was also found by other people. This is by the group of Wally Tronson uh, in the salamander. So in summary, feedback from horizontal cells to cones shift the activation potential of the calcium channels in photoreceptors. This is conserved over all vertebrate species tested so far. There's a fast one, um, and a slow uh, feedback component. Um, however, does this fast how does this fast component work? The mechanism that we proposed for this fast uh, component is inspired on the work of Bisov and Sura uh, Bura, uh, which was published in uh, 1986. So to understand this mechanism, we have to look at the cone photoreceptor synaptic terminal in detail. So in red, you see this, the cone synaptic terminal. It's the synaptic ribbons over here. And vesicles uh, alongside the ribbons. So there are many ribbons in the photoreceptor. These ribbons are aligned along the synaptic ribbon and glutamate release occurs here, very close to the horizontal cell dendrites, illustrated over here. And these processes are the bipolar cells. So one thing you can notice is this, that this synapse is a kind of enclosed compartment. The photoreceptor wraps around the dendrites of horizontal cells and bipolar cells. And that will become later, of important later. So to understand how negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones works, we have to make a little sidestep and talk about connections. 
connections are the, the proteins that form gap junctions. So um, gap junctions consist of two so-called hemichannels, which are docked in, uh, in which are docked and in that way connect two cells and make create an ion channel which uh, connects the intercellular solution of both cells. Those are the gap junctions. However, in the rare occasions, hemichannels can also occur as single hemichannels. And the, 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 the key feature of those hemichannels is that there is only labeling, or you can only find them in one membrane and not in the opposing membrane. Whereas in gap junctions, you fin find connections in both membranes. So in, in a collaboration with Reto Weiler, we looked at the, the um, localization of connections in the goldfish retina. And we found that horizontal cell dendrites express connections um, at the tips of their dendrites. But it was only present in one membrane, not in the membrane of the cone and not in the membrane of the bipolar cell. So there were hemichannels. So how could hemichannels um, be involved in negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones? So let's, um, let's I will talk you through this. So calcium channels are located at the, uh, near the synaptic ribbon in the cone photoreceptor. Calcium channels are voltage sensitive and regulate the calcium influx according to the membrane potential they sense. The calcium influx leads to a glutamate release. Basically, the calcium channels are a kind of voltage meter that measures the membrane potential and adjusts the release of glutamate. Hemichannels are expressed at the tips of the horizontal cell dendrites. Hemichannels are basically just holes in the cell, are not specific ion channels. And therefore, we can exchange them by resistance. So in the dark, when the horizontal cells rest at minus 40 millivolts, current will flow uh, through the hemichannels into the horizontal cell. This current has got to come from outside the complex, uh, convoluted synaptic structure. This convoluted synaptic structure, the extracellular space in this convoluted ex uh, uh, a synaptic structure will not be zero. So current through a resistor will lead to a voltage drop. So just the current that enters the hemichannels will lead to a small negativity deep in the synaptic cleft, let's say minus 10 millivolts. This has major consequences for the calcium channels that we are sitting uh, here. They will sense now a membrane potential of minus 40, minus minus 10 is only minus 30 millivolts. So when we hyperpolarize horizontal cells by light, for instance, they will hyperpolarize to minus 80 millivolts. That, for, uh, that will lead to an increase in current and therefore the increase of the negativity deep in the synaptic cleft. So the calcium, for the calcium channels, this is a huge difference. Now they, the voltage they sense is minus 40, minus minus 20, is only minus 20 millivolts. So hyperpolarization of horizontal cells leads to a local depolarization of the photoreceptor. This is a negative feedback pathway. So we used uh, a lot of, we did a lot of pharmacological experiments to show whether this was indeed the case and we could confirm this in all those experiments. I'm not going to, uh, to discuss these experiments in detail. Uh, what I will show you is the results uh, when we, uh, of the, what happens with feedback when we make a knockout uh, animal without a connection, uh, without the connections in horizontal cells. So this is the calcium current in control condition in green. When we depolarize horizontal cells with kinase, the, 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 the calcium current shifts to positive potentials. And when we hyperpolarize horizontal cells with D and QX, the calcium current shifts to negative potentials. This is what happens in the wild type animal. However, when we um, do the same experiment in the animals which don't have the connection at the dendrites of the horizontal cells, we see that the shift, the hyperpolarization induced shift is absent. So directly showing that the connection hemichannels are mediating negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones. So this is, so the mechanism we propose, the effective mechanism is a, a purely electrical. And that would mean that there should not be a synaptic delay between the, the horizontal cell response and the feedback response. 
So we uh, set out to determine uh, the synaptic delay between the feedback response and the horizontal cell response. To do that, we used the following uh, methods. So we modulated the horizontal cell membrane potential uh, with a sinusoidal, um, uh, sinusoidally, and then measured the, the feedback response in the cones. And as soon as there is a delay between the, um, and we determined the delay between the two sinusoidal uh, responses. This delay would be the synaptic delay. And you can do this for many different frequencies. And we did that for many different frequencies simultaneously. So we made the stimulus consisting of many different frequencies. We added all those stimuli together. And this is the stimulus, a complicated stimulus. This is the response of the horizontal cells. And this is the response of the, the, the feedback response. And using Fourier, Fourier transform, you can calculate the gain function and the phase function. And the phase function basically gives you the delay. There are two things to notice. First of all, there's no additional filtering going on for higher frequencies. And secondly, there's no delay, but no, no change in phase at high frequencies. And when you do that, when we, you look at very closely at this, you can calculate that the, you can determine that the synaptic delay is not significantly different from zero millivolt. So in summary, the fast component of feedback is mediated by hemichannel. This might be one of the fastest inhibitory systems. What about the slow component? For that, we have to go to a very old, or to an older paper of Barnes and Bue from 91. It, they showed that the calcium current of the calcium channels in photoreceptors are strongly influenced by the pH. In an alkaline condition, the calcium current is shifted negative, and in an acidic condition, the calcium current is shifted positive. So there is a shift of the activation potential, but there is also an increase in amplitude. This modulation of the calcium current can be due to so-called surface charge effects, or could be a direct action of protons on the calcium channel. So Aki Kaneko uh, looked at this uh, further in the in their, uh, 2003 paper. What they did, they measured feedback responses in the nude photoreceptors, and the same way as we did, but then they applied a high dose of heapies. That's a pH buffer. And what they found was that the feedback responses could be blocked by a high dose of heapies. And there was a recovery. So this effect of heapies is again a very general effect. Basically, everybody who tested it in uh, vertebrate animals found that heapies blocks uh, feedback. It's in newt, in uh, a mouse, in the goldfish, and in salamander. So the feedback is, um, it seems to depend on uh, pH. So uh, in the Rich Kramer lab was the first to show that there was indeed a, a pH change in the synaptic cleft. So what they did, they made uh, an animal, a zebrafish, which had a, a pH sensor hooked up to the calcium channel. So with that uh, pH sensor, they can measure the pH in the synaptic cleft. And what they found was that the pH changed indeed when uh, um, uh, in the synaptic cleft, and the time constant of this change was very slow, about 200 milliseconds. So could it be that the slow uh, feedback component is the pH dependent component? So, <clears throat> Uh, so one of the things, uh, uh, one of the things that led us to believe that was that the time constant of the slow component is very similar to the time constant of the pH change. Uh, Rich Kramer finds. So uh, we looked in this uh, a little bit further, and uh, the first thing we did was we looked at how the uh, the slow and the fast component dependent on the connection 55 hemi channels. So when you remove the hemi channels, what you see is that the fast component amplitude is reduced strongly, whereas the slow component amplitude is hardly um, affected. 
So the slow component is independent of Hemby channels. However, the slow component of all of feedback can be blocked by carbonoxalone. Carbonoxalone is a gap junction blocker. It's not only, but um, so you can do this, you can block feedback completely with many different uh, uh, gap junction blockers. However, gap junction blockers are not that specific. For instance, gap junction blockers also block panexins. So what are panexins? Panexins are uh, channels of our, our a class of membrane proteins with sequence homology to connexins. Contrary to connexins, panexins only form hem hemichannels. They don't form gap junctions. And furthermore, panexin channels are implicated in ATP release. So could it be that panexin channels are involved in, uh, this, in the pH mechanism, the pH feedback, in, uh, from horizontal cells to cones. So the first thing we did was we labeled the, the zebrafish retina with an antibody against uh, panexins, panexin one in this case. And what we found was nice labeling in the synaptic terminals of the photoreceptors. So this is the outer black swarm layer. And these dots are the synaptic terminals of the photoreceptor. When you look on the EM level, you see that the panexin one labeling is around horizontal cell membrane. The next thing we tested was whether horizontal cells are capable of uh, releasing ATP and whether this ATP release was mediated by panexin channels. So for that, we dissociated horizontal cells and measured uh, using fluorescent methods, the uh, ATP release. When we depolarized horizontal cells by AMPA, you see that there is an increase in ATP release. And when we blocked the hemi channels with probenicid, which is a specific blocker for panexins, we saw a decrease in ATP release. So this indicates that horizontal cells are capable of releasing ATP. So I don't have time to uh, discuss that, but we tested whether the ATP acted, acted on purinergic receptors. But that in this case, the purinergic receptors are not involved. So could ATP release change the pH in the synaptic cleft? So this is the structure of ATP. And we all know that ATP it can be hydrolyzed and that, you, uh, can that ATP can lose phosphate groups. And that's done by, uh, by an, uh, an enzyme called NTPDase. That's an extracellular enzyme, which uh, is present, of, uh, it's an extracellular enzyme. And so ATP can be hydrolyzed to adenosine. So you end up with adenosine, and you end up with phosphate groups and protons. And basically, this is a phosphate buffer. And the phos this phosphate buffer has a pKa of 7.2. So that means that if you hydrolyze a then of uh, ATP, basically you create a, a, a phosphate buffer that pushes the pH to 7.2. And the adenosine is further uh, uh, degraded to ADA by uh, to adenosine by the enzyme called ADA. So the next thing we did was to look whether these extracellular en enzymes are present in the synaptic cleft. And what we I can show you here is the, the, the terminals of the photoreceptors. In green, the this is the uh, localization of the panexin channels. Here in uh, green, the localization of the NTPDase the, the, that hydrolyzes ATP, which overlaps with the CLUAR2 labeling, which labels horizontal cell dendrites. For, uh, the same holds for ADA, which is also present in the synaptic terminal of the photoreceptors and also uh, is close in the approximation of the CLUAR2 labeling. Remember, these two en enzymes are extracellular enzymes. They are present in the synaptic cleft. So how can this, uh, how does this ATP release lead to a negative feedback pathway? So uh, this is the hypothesis we have. So we have connexin hemichannels, panexin hemichannels, and calcium channels. So in the dark, horizontal cells rest at minus 40 millivolt, and due to the effective interaction, the, uh, the potential in the synaptic cleft will be about minus 10. 
because of the current flowing through the connection channel. At the same time, ATP is released by panexin channels because panexin channels are open at the depolarized state. ATP uh, is released in the synaptic cleft. With the two uh, enzymes, NTPDase and ADA, they'll uh, hydrolyze ATP to iodine and a phosphate buffer. And this phosphate buffer makes the synaptic cleft acidic and inhibits the calcium channel. The, uh, furthermore, the, the phosphate buffer will diffuse out of the synaptic cleft. And so we will get a steady state of uh, the, the creation of the phosphate buffer and the diffusion uh, away of the uh, phosphate buffer. All these processes together will set the, the activation potential of the calcium uh, current in the dark. Now we hyperpolarize horizontal cells. The effective current increases, makes the synaptic, uh, of, makes the potential deep in the synaptic cleft uh, slightly negative, and that leads to the shift of the calcium current to negative potentials. However, in due time, the buffer will start diffusing away from the synaptic cleft, and that will make that the pH in the synaptic cleft becomes more uh, alkaline, and that leads to a further shift of the calcium current and an increase in the calcium current. So the fast feedback mechanism is the effective mechanism and that shifts the calcium current to negative potential. The slow feedback mechanism is a pH buffer modulation and that leads to an amplitude increase and a shift of the calcium current to negative potential. Again, we did a lot of pharmacological experiments to uh, prove this uh, hypothesis. But the most uh, uh, convincing, uh, uh, the most direct uh, uh, way of showing this is making an animal that does not have the panexin channels. And that's exactly what we did. However, zebrafish uh, uh, has a duplicated gene, uh, it has an additional gene duplication. And that meant that there were two panexin 1 channels, panexin 1a and panexin 1b. And so we had to make two knockout animals. But as you can see, when you knock out either panexin 1a or 1b, the feedback response uh, reduces. In black, we have the wild type response. In the red, we have the response in the mutant. The double mutant is also reduced. And if we knock out connexin 55.5 in the panexins, almost all feedback is gone. So when we look a little bit closer to the, the responses of the, the feedback responses, you see that the um, that it, it, at least the, there is an indication that the, the reduction due to feed, uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the, to, due to the deletion of the panexins affects especially the slow component of feedback. Feedback becomes very fast in the uh, knockout. Okay, so you might have noticed that I talked about changing a buffer capacity in the synaptic terminal of in the synaptic cleft. So let me explain why that uh, is so important. So this is the if, if, uh, synaptic terminal of a photoreceptor in the goldfish. And a, a number of years ago, we set out to determine the extracellular space of the, uh, in the synapse. So we measured the extracellular space and calculated its volume and its volume is about 0.88 cubic micrometer. This volume co contains about 38 protons. So based on the work of Steve Barnes, you can calculate that for every millivolt of uh, shift in um, uh, uh, activation function of the calcium current, you need to have 0.1 uh, pH unit change. That means that for a, a, a feedback response, in the physiological range, 19 protons have to move. So if the system depends on the release of protons and the uptake of protons, it becomes a very um, a noisy system, which has only a very small dynamic range. As soon as you modulate the, the buffer capac capacity, those numbers of protons become statistical properties of the system. And in that way, you can uh, move, you can change the, the, the number of protons over very uh, nicely and uh, in a graded uh, manner. So the only way this pH mechanism can work 
in a, in a stable and um, uh, low noise condition is if you change the buffer capacity instead of uh, 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 releasing protons or taking up protons. So in summary, the slow feedback component is, modulated, is modulating the pH in the synaptic cleft. The pH change is due to a change in buffer capacity. ATP release via ATP 1x and 1 hemichannels creates the pH buffer in the synaptic cleft. So what about GABA? So there is general agreement that horizontal cells contain GABA. That's found in the fish here, in the goldfish. At least one type of horizontal cells contains GABA, the H1 cells. And it is found in guinea pig. Um, but also there is evidence that uh, uh, mouse horizontal cells and rat horizontal cells contain GABA. There's also consensus that cones and horizontal cells have GABA A receptors. So this is work from uh, uh, Tachibana and Kaneko, where they puffed GABA on the synaptic terminal of a photoreceptor and got a very nice response. Uh, we showed it in the goldfish that goldfish cones have a GABA A conductance, which reverses nicely at uh, the, uh, the equilibrium potential of chloride. Um, Furthermore, we showed uh, in, uh, that horizontal cells have GABA A receptors. That's uh, in salamander, yeah, also a current nicely reserved versus uh, around EC, uh, ECL and is pycotoxin sensitive. And Steve Barnes showed uh, recently that also in mouse horizontal cells, you have a GABA A receptor. So horizontal cells release GABA and cones and or horizontal cells have GABA A receptors. So what, what, do they, what does this GABAergic mechanism do? So again, there is great consensus of the effect of GABA on feedback responses. So uh, Verwey and Schnapp uh, showed in 2003 that when you apply GABA, the feedback responses measured in the photoreceptors of, of macaque monkey is reduced. When you apply pycotoxin, the feedback response is increased. We showed the same in goldfish, control response, feedback response in Visgaba and Vorjaak, and control in PTX and Vorjaak. So GABA inhibits negative feedback, and pycotoxin blocking the GABA receptors uh, enhances uh, negative feedback. And the same was found recently by uh, the, the, uh, the laboratory of Steve Barnes in the mouse, rat, and guinea pig. So in general terms, GABA seems always to inhibit negative feedback and pycotoxin seems to enhance negative feedback. So, although there seems great consistency in this, there is one thing we have to keep in mind. The non-mammalian non horizontal cells release GABA via the GABA transporter. The mammalian horizontal cells release GABA via vesicles. So we uh, looked a little bit further in this uh, issue of GABA, so what GABA is doing. So we recorded from a cone photoreceptor and applied GABA. And what you see is that there is a current uh, 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 appearing with a reversal potential around ECL. When we applied parcotoxin in the endogenous condition where we did not apply any additional GABA, you see that there also the current is blocked which reverses around ECL. And finally, when we block the GABA transporter, which in fish is essential for the release of GABA by horizontal cells, we see that a conductance which reverses around ECL also closes. So this means that in the fish retina, horizontal cells release GABA and that this uh, GABA opens a chloride conductance in photoreceptors. So horizontal cells feed back to the cones via a GABAergic mechanism. How then can it be that we did not see this in our light-induced feedback responses? So for that, we uh, uh, wanted to see whether we could find any evidence that horizontal cells uh, modulate the GABA-A conductance in photoreceptors in a light-driven manner. 
So the clamp to horizontal cell at minus 100 millivolts. Set ECL very positive at around minus 10 millivolts. And then, uh, then when you do this, you see this current. This is in the dark. Then we, apply, then we applied a long light stimulus. And as you can see, basically nothing happened with the GABA-A conductance in the photoreceptors. From this panel, we know horizontal cells project to the photoreceptors via a GABAergic mechanism. However, here we show that hyperpolarization of horizontal cells by light does not lead to a change in GABA release and thus to a change in the GABA conductance in the photoreceptor. So this led us to, uh, to the idea that maybe the GABA release is modulated only very, very, very slowly. And indeed, there is a lot of evidence for that. So one part of the evidence is the following. So in the, when I was in the Verblin lab, we looked at uh, horizontal cells in the salamander. And we noticed that when you apply 100 micromolar GABA, the response shape of horizontal cell responses became as exactly the same as the dark adapted response shape. This is the fast horizontal cell response in the light adapted condition. This is when you apply GABA, or it could be, it is exactly the same when you have a very dark adapted retina. So it's, it seems that GABA release is very high in the dark adapted condition. So work of Steve Jazula also indicates that. In, when you take a retina and measure the GABA release and you put the retina in the dark, you see a slowly, slow increase in GABA release. When you put the retina back in the light, you see a very slow decrease in GABA release. So GABA seems to be modulated in a very slow manner. And finally, there's uh, old work of uh, O'Brien and uh, Dowling that show that the GABA release by horizontal cells is under dopaminergic control. Uh, GABA, the dopamine um, um, inhibits GABA release via a second messenger system in horizontal cells. So dopamine release is high during the day and um, therefore GABA release is inhibited during the day. Dopamine is low in the dark and therefore GABA release is high in the dark adapted condition. So that would mean that negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones is inhibited during the dark adapted condition because GABA inhibits negative feedback. And indeed, that's what has been found by uh, a number of people. And here I show you an example of uh, work of Wagner and Jamgos. So you have in the fish retina, you have three types of horizontal cells, the monophasic horizontal cells, the biphasic horizontal cells, and the triphasic horizontal cells. These are responses to different colors of light. And the biphasic horizontal cell, the H2 cell, depolarizes to red light stimuli. However, when you record from an H2 horizontal cell in the completely dark adapted retina, there's no depolarization. These depolarizations are purely driven by negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones. So in the dark adapted condition, no depolarization, and that means that there is no feedback. When we light adapt the retina, you see that the uh, depolarizations become very prominent. So in the dark adapted condition, negative feedback is weak. In the, in the light adapted condition, negative feedback is strong. So this is the, the so, so we came to the following um, hypothesis. So in the light adapted condition, we have the, the dopamine that release is high, gamma release is inhibited, and feedback from horizontal cells to cones is fully functional. And that functions partly via the effective mechanism and partly via the panexin mediated mechanism. In the dark adapted condition, however, gamma release uh, is high, although the dopamine release is low, gamma release is high, and the gamma will open a gamma conductance, in this case in the photoreceptor. What happens now is that the photoreceptor, the GABA receptor, will start supplying current to the synaptic cleft. And this current will flow into the HIMA channels and basically shunt the effective mechanism. So all the current needed to enter the horizontal cell is now supplied by the photoreceptor. And there's no need anymore for to recruit current from outside the synaptic terminal. 
that means there's no modulation anymore of this, uh, uh, this the current through these uh, uh, resistors and no effective interaction. So basically, the gamma receptor uh, shunts the, uh, the effective mechanism. Interestingly, this it doesn't matter where the GABA receptor is, whether it is on the cone photoreceptor or whether it is on the horizontal cell dendrite. In both cases, the GABA receptor can do the same. So in summary, there, there, there are three, the, the three proposed feedback mechanisms work in synergy. A fast effective feedback, a slow, slow pH buffer feedback, and a very slow GABAergic modulatory mechanism. The GABAergic mechanism is presumably important for the reduction of feedback in the dark adaptive condition. The GABAergic mechanism works via shunting of the effective mechanism. But other mechanisms like uh, HUN3 flux through GABA receptors may also be involved in the modulation of feedback. So what's the function of this, completed, this complicated feedback synapse? So this is the view out of my window in the, in the laboratory in Amsterdam. And basically it's an extremely boring view. Nothing is happening. You see occasionally a car coming by and there's a windmill spinning. But most of the time nothing happens, both in space and in time. So the visual system is basically built to remove redundancies. And there's a lot of redundant information in this scene, both in space and in time. So what, um, what we propose is that the spatial redundancy reduction is mostly done by the effective feedback mechanism, because it's very fast. Why should sp the spatial redundancy reduction need a very fast inhibitory system. So what the spatial redundancy reduction is, it measures this, the, 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 the global activity and uh, subtracts that from what a, cone, a, a certain cone sees. If this was very slow, then the surrounds of this response would lag the center. So for spatial redundancy reduction, you need a fast system. This system needs horizontal cell integration, because it has to estimate the activity uh, uh, over space. Temporal re redundancy reduction, on the other hand, we propose that is due to the Panixin 1A ATP feedback mechanism. It's slow because it has to estimate the activity over time. Therefore, it needs to be slow. And one interesting thing is that is the ATP uh, feedback, uh, Panexin feedback mechanism might even be relatively local in the uh, tips of the dendrites of horizontal cell. So I, I told you that there are two components to feedback, an effective feedback mechanism and a, a, a Panexin feedback me mechanism. Are those components present to the same extent in all animals? So what we expect is that the animals with high visual acuity, like zebrafish, have a strong, fast, effective feedback component because they are highly they are they they have a big need for spatial redundancy reduction. However, animals with low visual acuity, like mice, have a strong, a stronger, slow uh, pH buffer dependent feedback component. <coughs> So, however, this needs to be looked at uh, very carefully. I think it's time to start a comparative uh, uh, physiological experiments to see how the various feedback components depend on the environment the different animals live in. So, but what is the functional consequence of this feedback as a whole? So, this is, of course, something you all know that we have gray dots here. A gray dot in a, a light uh, environment looks darker than a gray dot in the dark environment, whereas the, all the dots are equally gray. So this is due to the horizontal cell to cone negative feedback. So when there is a lot of activity, the center will be inhibited. When there is a, a little activity, the center will not be inhibited. 
However, there's something weird to this. Now we have a, a flickering spot of light. And you see it barely flickers in a dark uh, environment. So what we, when I, I will switch on the surround in a minute, but what we expect is that when we activate the surround, that will inhibit the center. So that will uh, reduce the flickering. However, what we experience is that the flickering becomes more vivid. Now there's, you barely see the flickering, and now it's really obvious that the spot is flickering. So what's going on? <clears throat> to understand what's going on, we have to look uh, at uh, the relation of cone photoreceptors and ganglion cells, and at the, the, the specifics of the uh, feedback synapse. So cone photoreceptors show a very nice sustained response. They, these are really DC neurons. They, the, the membrane potential is completely dependent on the amount of light the cone sees. Ganglion cells, on the other hand, most of them respond with very transient responses. The consequence is that the ganglion cell is hardly interested in the sustained change in membrane potential. They are very, very interested in the change in cone membrane potential. So far, we have discussed negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones only in the relation to the sustained membrane potential changes. Now, let's see if, uh, what happens if we consider what happens with a change in membrane potential. So, this is what I already showed you. Negative, this is the calcium current. In, uh, with, without feedback, when you activate feedback, the calcium current shifts to negative potentials. This is an expanded version of this part of the calcium current. Cones hyperpolarized from minus 40 to minus, is, let's say, 50. That leads to a reduction in the calcium current. When negative feedback shifts the calcium current to positive potentials, you see an increase in, calcium, uh, in the calcium current. So reduction in glutamate release, increase in glutamate release. This is a negative feedback pathway. When we consider the sustained membrane potential. However, if we modulate the membrane potential of a cone slightly around its dark and resting membrane potential, you will see that that will lead to a, a, a big change in calcium current because the slope of the calcium current is very steep over here. When we hyperpolarize the photoreceptor to let's say minus 50, the slope reduces. So the same modulation of the membrane potential here will only induce a small change in calcium current. Active, so hyperpolarization of a cone reduces the synaptic gain. When we shift the calcium current to negative potential, what happens is that the synaptic gain, the slope of the calcium current, increases again. Feedback from horizontal cells increases the synaptic gain. So can we see this? Can we measure this? So we did the following experiment. We modulated the membrane potential of a cone in conditions where there was no feedback and when feedback was active. So this is the membrane potential change in a voltage clamped cone. And this is the resulting current when we clamp a cell at minus 40 millivolts. And this is basically the calcium current. This is in condition without a horizontal cell activation. When we uh, hyperpolarize horizontal cells, you get this result. And this is the calcium current with hyperpolarized uh, horizontal cells. And you can see that it has increased uh, tremendously. Also, you can see this effect at horizontal cell level. This is a horizontal cell response to a flash of one second, flash of light of one second. Early on, the feedback is low because only the, the effective feedback works. Whereas later on the response, feedback is high because both the effective and the uh, ATP, uh, the, the pH feedback are active. That would mean that in this condition, the synaptic gain is low, and in this condition, the synaptic gain is high. What we did was we stimulated the, uh, the horizontal cells now, not with a flash of light, but with a flash of sinusoidally modulated light. And as you can see, 
that here is that the amplitudes of the sinusoid, uh, of the response to the sinusoid increases, directly showing that the synaptic gain increases. <clears throat> so this is important, and it will be important to, to, um, for the rest of the talk. So what I would like to do is to consider what happens when we project some kind of a, a stimulus onto the photoreceptors. So we have a kind of random stimulus over here. Let, let's say this is this, the, the response of the photoreceptors to this random stimulus. Yeah, This is the response of the photoreceptors. That response is sent to the horizontal cells and the horizontal cells integrate this signal and basically come with, come with this uh, response, the red one, which is basically the average signal of the photoreceptors. That's the predicted signal. Basically, the horizontal cells send a signal back to the cones. This is what you would see if there was no detail in the stimulus. Horizontal cells, there, there is this subtracted mechanism, this negative feedback mechanism from horizontal cells to cones. So the a signal that's sent to the bipolar cells will basically be just a smaller signal, but, uh, which is uh, <coughs> just a smaller signal. Now the mean activity has been subtracted. However, I've shown you that also the synaptic gain changes. So we don't have only the subtractive activity of interaction, but also this multiplicative interaction. And that enhances the signal again, such that it is scaled properly for the dynamic range of the bipolar cells. So this is a form of predictive coding. So horizontal cells estimate what there would be if there, uh, what the response of a photoreceptor would be if there was no detail in the scene. That signal is sent back to the photoreceptors and subtracted from their activity. And the, 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 own, and the, the details that remain are amplified by this multiplicative interaction. Okay, so, so far we have basically discussed over cones uh, only discussed cones. However, there are three types of cones, red, green, and blue cones. I told you that horizontal cells feed back to the cones and that uh, this interaction is a kind of uh, subtractive and uh, multiplicative interaction. Now the question is, do red cones receive a red feedback signal, green cones a green feedback signal, and blue cones a blue feedback signal, or are the spectral um, uh, inputs of the various photoreceptors already mixed at this level. So what we are going to, one of the, 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 the major features of any color vision system is color constancy. And I, I will show you what color constancy is. So you see a red apple over here. And when I put a blue filter on that apple, we get a really blue apple. And nobody would consider this as a a, a good pick from the fruit basket. However, when I expand this filter over the whole scene, you will immediately recognize this apple as a red apple again. And this is instantaneous. It's not an adaptational stuff thing. It's immediately there. So this is color constancy. So color constancy is the ability of the visual system to perceive colors are rather constant, despite of considerable changes in the spectral composition of the illuminate. So how and where is color constancy generated? In primates, the first color constant neurons are found in V4. And therefore people argued that color constancy was calculated in V4. However, all animals with color vision tested so far on color constancy are color constant. So it seems to be a fundamental property of any color vision system. So uh, the, the group of Christian Neumeyer uh, tested this in goldfish. So they trained goldfish to swim to uh, colored objects. And um, so there was a training field and there were blue objects and yellow objects. And after a, a long training session, the fish learned to swim to the training test field. This was when the fish, when the scene was illuminated with white light. Then they applied blue light 
and you can calculate that uh, wait that the blue light that the spectral output of the test field and the white light is similar to the, uh, the the yellow test field this yellow test field and the blue light so if the fish was not color constant it would swim to this test field however goldfish are very, very color constant so this suggests that um, uh, goldfish which, which don't have a v4 uh, are color constant and it was not only true for blue light but also was true for yellow light okay so how does this work so we were in intrigued by this uh, this finding and this mechanism how this could this work and so we started to record uh, the, the the spectral sensitivities of uh, photoreceptors so these are uh, flashes of light of different colors and this is uh, different intensities and as you uh, when you look at this closely you see that the various responses uh, that you can exchange intensity and uh, wavelengths so a, a certain uh, intensity and wavelengths basically generates a, a, a response similar to another wavelength and another intensity and when you connect all the points um, of uh, equal amplitude with each other you get a so-called spectral sensitivity curve when you do that uh, uh, for many uh, cones you can calculate uh, those curves those are the spectral sensitivity curves of the L, M, and S cones in the, the goldfish. The blue cones, the green cones, and the red cones. Now the question was, do the various cones, do the blue cones receive a blue feedback signal, the, red, uh, the green cones a green feedback signal, the uh, red cones a red feedback signal? So we did the same experiment, now, but now for the feedback responses. Again, you can connect the points with equal amplitude with each other and obtain the, the, the feedback spectra. And what we found was that the feedback spectra were completely different than from the, the, the spectral sensitivities of the cones themselves. They were always very broad. So now we have to go back to what I told you before. Cone hyperpolarization reduces the synaptic gain, whereas feedback from horizontal cells increases the synaptic gain. So this is important. So let's assume that we illuminate a scene with a, a lot of red light. For the blue cone, the, the, the blue cone itself is not sensitive to red light. So its synaptic gain will not be reduced due to di direct light stimulation. However, it will get a lot of uh, feedback in the red part of the spectrum. So that leads to an increase in its synaptic gain. So with a red, a global red illumination, the blue cones become more sensitive. The red cones, on the other hand, are strongly stimulated by the red light, and therefore they reduce their synaptic gain. They also increase the synaptic gain slightly due to negative feedback, but the effect of the hyperpolarization is much larger uh, than the effect of feedback. So global red illumination reduces the synaptic gain of L cones, and increases the synaptic gain of S cones. So, and that led us to, to think that this mechanism would lead to color constancy, because there it compensates for the global uh, color of the illumination. So, what we did was we um, wait. Uh, so we uh, um, okay. So what we did was we measure, so we simulated uh, now a color constancy experiment. So we present a white dot of light in, uh, and uh, illuminate that with different colors of light. And we will present the responses of the cones uh, in color space. So the response of a red cone, looking at the white dot, is, uh, uh, is uh, plotted along this axis, of the green cone along that axis, and the blue cone along that axis. And that gives you a vector in color space. You can normalize that and you have a point in the color triangle. So, um, so we basically built the, uh, the whole outer retina of the horizontal cell cone system uh, in a model and looked at how this model uh, behaved uh, 
depending on the color of the, the global illumination, then it went from pure green, from green to red. <coughs> so this is pure green, this is pure red stimulation, and this is pure, pure blue. So the stimulus changed from green to red. The cone membrane potentials, uh, first of all, they shifted to the center because of adaptation of the cones, but then the green lights stimulate the green cone stronger than the red, than the red light. Yeah? So it followed basically nicely the, the um, stimulus. This is the cone membrane potential response. However, when you look at the cone output, which is influenced by negative feedback, you see that basically the, that was independent of the color of the global illumination. Oh. So this not only holds for the red-green uh, axis, but also for the blue-yellow axis. So when we change the, the, the color of the illumination from blue to red, it, um, uh, uh, it behaved similar. Okay, so why then are horizontal cells spectrally coded? So we have three cone types, blue, green, and red cones, uh, which strongly overlapping spectra. They project to horizontal cells, and horizontal cells in the fish retina have those complicated spectral uh, sensitivities. Hyperpolarizing over the whole spectrum, a biphasic cell, which depolarizes in the blue, of in, in the red, part and the triphasic one. And then the feedback signal those horizontal cells generate are again a broad, a spectrally broad signal. To understand why horizontal cells have this complicated uh, spectral composition, we have to go to an old paper of uh, Buchsbaum and uh, uh, Gottschalk. They asked the question, how can I code those the information present in the three cone types most efficiently in three other cells. And basically, the, the, their answer was, the mathematical solution was, that you need a cell that basically sums all those spectra, a broadband cell, a monophasic horizontal cell, a biphasic cell, and a triphasic cell. So these are basically the three principal components of the responses of the photoreceptor. So horizontal cells seem to store the principal components of the, the, uh, the global illumination. So we have an input that is uh, activating the cone photoreceptors. They send it to the three horizontal cell types where the, the, the spectral composition is stored in three principal components. These three principal components are used to generate broad feedback spectra for specific for each cone type, presumably via a kind of linear combinations. This feedback signal is sent back to the photoreceptor to modify the output, to normalize the output of the, the, the cones, such that they become independent for the global illumination. So the, 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 the input is converted into its principal components, and then fed back to, the, uh, to normalize the output of the photoreceptor. And in that way, generates a, a, a form of color constancy. So, so in fish, horizontal cells are spectrally coded. One could argue, oh, well, this is nice. Maybe this color constancy mechanism only works, uh, but this uh, uh, works nicely for fish, but does it also work for primates? Because primate horizontal cells are not spectrally coded. So these are uh, simulated horizontal cell responses. And so we took the, 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 the uh, color constancy model and replaced the cone photoreceptors for the human photoreceptors and uh, horizontal cells for primate horizontal cells. And then calculated whether this model uh, could also generate color constancy. And indeed, these are the responses of the cones due to the change in the global illumination. And this is the output of the cones. So, you don't need per se the opponency of the horizontal cell response to generate color constancy. We can discuss later in the discussion why fish use this scheme and primates use this scheme to do basically the same job. So 
to finally uh, to to finalize this uh, argument, let's see what uh, how we see color. So color is based on the ratio of the activity of the red, green, and blue cones. Yeah. So light. So one thing we have one thing we have to realize is that in the outside world world we have wavelengths. In our brain, is that's the only place where color exists. There's no color in the outside world. So light illuminates a scene, and the re re reflected light enters our eye. And there, the, that activates cone photoreceptors, and they send a signal to higher visual areas. And the ratio of those signals determines the color. Yeah, and then we perceive this apple as red. So now we change the illumination. Now that means that the, the also the activation of the various cone types has differed. Now there's a lot of blue light, so it, it, that suggests that a big blue signal is sent to the brain and only a minor red signal. And that's the apple we perceive, we see is not red anymore. But that if uh, finally uh, the apple is perceived red because there is a color correction. And Zeki uh, suggested that that happens in V4. However, I hope I've shown to you that presumably this is not happening in V4, but that we get a so-called wavelength correction by feedback from horizontal cells to cones already in the retina, such that the signals sent to V4 are already balanced and that we therefore see the apple as red. So in conclusion, the feedback mechanism from horizontal cells to cones is highly conserved. The feedback from horizontal cells to cones consists of a fast effective and a slow pH buffer dependent mechanism. Feedback from horizontal cells to cones is modulated by a GABAergic mechanism, which might function to shut down feedback from horizontal cells to cones in the darker depth state. The ratio of the two feedback components might vary between different animal species, depending on their ecological niche. Negative feedback from horizontal cells to cones increases the synaptic gain of cones. The various horizontal cell layers function in concert to generate the first steps of color constancy. So this uh, work has uh, uh, this work has been done with many many people uh, as collaborators, and I'm very grateful to all those uh, people. However, there are a, a special group of people who have been working in my lab over the uh, last years that made this uh, work really possible. And I would like to acknowledge those people because those people have done the majority of the experiments in my lab. And I'm very grateful that I was able to work together with those people. I would like to end here and uh, answer some questions. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Martin. That was a very deep uh, way through. Um, first, I would like to apologize to everybody that just join us. Uh, if you had the bad timing on your schedule for this talk, I'm very sorry if you're just joining us. Uh, this was due, if, especially if you're in America, this was due to a time changing here in Europe. So very sorry for that. Maybe you can rewind to the beginning of this talk, but we're going to move this question now. So if you want to join us, still join us and maybe watch uh, the talk later. Again, very sorry for that. Um, thanks a lot, Martin. I have a question from um, Tom Baden. Do you think there is a possibility for different horizontal cell types to use different balance of this mechanism? I don't know where Tom posted this, so I guess he's referring to the, the three mechanism you described at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> so do you think there's different HC type to use different balance of this mechanism? And Zeus setting up different properties in different spectral cone combination to the main contact. Um, so, for, so we looked at the expression of the various connections in the various horizontal cells, uh, for instance, and we see that all horizontal cells express connection 55.5. So for the effective mechanism, uh, we don't have any evidence that the different horizontal cell types, the H1, 2, or 3, uh, behave differently. Uh, also for the panexin staining, we did not see uh, a clear difference uh, between uh, we did not see any difference in the uh, uh, dendritic staining of the different types of horizontal cells. So in principle, it could be, but uh, we didn't find it. 
right. Do you think there might be some chromatic selectivity between center surround in Arunta cell or in cone? Sorry? Anyway. I think, do you think there might be some chromatic selective center surround in cones or in horizontal cells? So, um, in, in, in the fish retina, and uh, so basically in all animals, uh, most of the cones receive input uh, from more than one horizontal cell. So, um, the there has been a long discussion whether there is uh, uh, the, the, the H1 horizontal cells um, and the H2 and 3 horizontal cells. One is uh, uh, a luminosity cell and the other the uh, chromatic cells. However, in the end, all the horizontal cells feed back to the cones again. And the mm -hmm. feedback signal uh, measured in the cones becomes very broad. So we don't find... so. So I spent a lot of time uh, looking at horizontal cell responses. However, the f I came finally to the, to the conclusion that it's not that useful to look at horizontal cell responses. We have to look at the output of the horizontal cells. And that's the cones. And that's a feedback signal in the cones. And the only signal that matters is what a cone receives from the horizontal cells. And that's a spectrally broad signal. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you for that. Um, if you want to come ask a question yourself, uh, we shared the link to this room. So if you want to join us, please do so. I will continue with a question from Brent Young. Do you think that the color constancy mechanism will differ between fish and primates with more central processing in primates and peripheral processing in fish? So I think uh, so color constancy is so fundamental for color vision. So basically, if you are not color constant, color is not very useful because it will continuously change when you move around. So an object does not have a fixed color. So if you are not color constant, the use of color to discriminate an object becomes less efficient. So it, it, my feeling is that color constancy is a fundamental property of any color vision system. So, at, um, and given the, the, the organization of the outer retina, it's likely that a, a major part of the color constancy is generated at that level. So the question whether it is different in primates or in uh, fish, uh, our simulations at least show that the, 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 the mechanism will function as well in primate as in fish. So the only difference is that the uh, in primates the LNM cones are very over uh, are very close together. So the, the spectra are very overlapping. So it um, so if you want to make a biphasic horizontal cell, for instance, in the primates, basically you subtract uh, two almost equal signals, and that will result in a very very small signal. And that's not very efficient. The mm. final result of the three horizontal cells is a spectrally broad feedback signal. So you can also generate that by two spectrally broad horizontal cells. The opponency is not critical. It's, the opponency is there because it is an efficient way of coding. It's not a fundamental property of the mechanism. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I have a question from, I'm sorry if I spelled this wrong, Santanam Abirami. Will there be any shift in this feedback mechanism during RP or any other photoreceptor damage? Sorry, could you repeat it? <laughs> Will there be any shift in this feedback mechanism during RP, retina pigment disease, okay. I guess, or any uh, other photoreceptor damage? Yeah, so, so during those diseases, uh, so the output of the cone and the horizontal cells keep each other balanced. So as soon as you, you are removing uh, an input or horizontal cell, for instance, the whole system might get out of balance and you might move it to a, a, a range where you are not very efficiently transmitting information anymore. So I don't know what will happen in RP, but it's a very delicate system which needs to be balanced. So you just cannot remove uh, uh, 
one thing because the, you cannot remove horizontal cells, for instance, because then the calcium current will move all the way positive and you will lose synaptic transmission. So it's very sensitive to, I think, to, to uh, degeneration of the horizontal cells. Um, I have one from Gautam Awatramani. So intense talk, thanks Martin. What is, what is there no role of IH, sorry, in mediating slow feedback? I'm not trying to understand this question. What is there no role of IH, EH maybe, in mediating slow feedback? I'm not sure. Both Ram, if you're around, if you want to join. Inhibitory current, thank you. Now oh. someone just. So, why is there no role of inhibitory current in mediating slow feedback? It doesn't make sense. He, he's wondering if there's a role for IH in the feedback process. So, so in which, which cell? Ah, that's what it means, sorry. So, so there is one interesting thing. So when you, when horizontal cells are depolarized, they are relatively, have a relatively high input resistance. However, when you hyperpolarize them, the, the, the potassium channel opens, which makes them in the input resistance lower. And it allows for more current to flow through the hemi channels. So there was a whole uh, issue about uh, that the input resistance of dissociated horizontal cells was not low enough to generate all the current which is needed for an effective mechanism. But horizontal cells are only have only a high input resistance if they are depolarized. So if you hyperpolarize horizontal cells, channels open and they become more leaky, mm -hmm. such that you can generate more current. Maybe that's... I don't know. I guess, Gautam, if you want some follow-up, you can join us. Um, I have a question from Simon, which is with us in this room. So Simon, if you want to ask your question yourself. Hello, Simon, by the way. Hi, Martin. Hi. Great talk. I've just given lectures on this to my students and you've put me to shame. So anyway, my question is about the isolation of the, the different synaptic ribbons within the cone pedicel. And also the isolation, the, um, so is there much crosstalk in this effactic and pH feedback between the different synaptic ribbons? So, so I think that depends on which animal you're looking at. Right. So the, the, the synaptic structure of the primates is slightly different than from the, from the zebrafish, for instance. So in the zebrafish, I think uh, there might is a big chance that there is an effective crosstalk. For the pH mechanism, there is one thing I'm still very intrigued about. So panexin channels are gated by intercellular calcium. So you have the panexin channel, you have the dendrite, there's a glutamate receptor which is permeable for calcium. And just very close to that, you have the panexin channel, which can be modulated basically by opening the, the glutamate receptor on that dendrite, so, which is extremely local uh, mechanism that could work in one dendrite. There's no need for integration in the horizontal cells. So, so it, it is kind of appealing to me. So I don't have any evidence that this, this works, but it's kind of appealing thought to me that the, for the temporal redundancy reduction, you can do this especially basically in individual dendrites of horizontal cells. Whereas for the effective mechanism, you need the spatial integration. So what about the flat bipolar cells? Are they going to get the same feedback as the invaginating bipolar cells? So, so um, um, Steve Fries looked at the difference in timing of the, the, yeah, the invaginating no. and the bipolar. So they are looking at the same glutamate release of the photoreceptor. But do they see the same pH signal and do they see... Oh, no, the but, yeah, so then the question is, is there a direct modulation of the glutamate receptors on the bipolar cells by the pH? Because in your circuit diagram, you put a lot of, uh, you place your resistor in the neck that's uh -huh. around yeah, but, the imaginating yeah. bipolars. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because the critical point for modulation is the calcium current. 
and then you get glutamate release and that affects the bipolar cells. However, I cannot exclude that there is a pH effect on the glutamate receptors on the bipolar yeah. cells. Yeah. yeah. All right, people, um, I will just end the stream right now. So if you want to join us uh, in the Zoom room, do it now. I will just pass uh, a message from Christian Poller, who apparently with uh, Willy wants to organize an informal Zoom meeting on a focus on the autoretina. So if you're interested in that, just contact uh, Christian. We we're going to receive uh, Willy in early December, if I remember right. So maybe I will talk about it later on. Thanks everybody for this talk. I will now close the live stream. Join us on the Zoom room if you want to continue talking about Martin Stone. Thank you. So Martin, um, I'm yes.